Okay, I think that I am here. Um, that was an awesome just section of the interviews and Kim said at the beginning was amazing. Please tip those performers. Um, I'm Maria Headley. I am going to read you a story. Um, this story I wrote in about 2014 and it is called Dim Sun. It was written in a moment when the world was very different from the world we have now, but I write speculative fiction usually. So I have to say that um, sometimes I'm just a few years ahead. So we're here hopefully approaching a better time. This is a funny story. This time it really is a funny story. I needed something light. Um, and it's about restaurants and galactic restaurant critics. It's sort of like a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy kind of story. Here we go. Okay, dim sun. They're rolling the cart around the edge of the room and the crowd is salivating. Everyone but us has been waiting in line for hours. This is the place to go if you want to eat dim sun, and everyone knows it, particularly after the article my buddy Bert Gold wrote. This restaurant used to be a secret. I tried my damnedest to keep him from writing the address down, but he couldn't be stopped. Some people are secret sharers. That's what they live to do, and that's Bert Gold. He tells one secret and then goes off hunting another. Bert Gold's an old white man with a ponytail and a belly, and the only way he's ever been able to get the ladies interested is to take them out to dinner at places they can't get into on their own. Almost nobody but Bert can get in everywhere, and it's not because Bert's cool. It's just that his job is a password. No one really wants him to come in. He's a curve skewer in terms of the look of a place, but his recommendation means insane business. His bad review means bust. The result of Bert Gold's prodigious appetite and connections is that all over the universe, pinned to the back walls of restaurants hoping not to re-encounter his savage tongue, there are photographs of him in the company of young lovelies. It might be enough to make a person jealous if a person were inclined toward jealousy. I'm just hungry. That's the shit of my position. Buddy to the legend. The legend makes the reservation and sometimes when the legend's lady cancels, I get to horn in. Today is no exception. Bert's been working on a woman 20 years too young for him and finally she got a date with someone writer. He's a lech, but he doesn't seem to care. He seems to think the universe owes him younger women. Universe owes all of us something, is my feeling. We all had bad childhoods. Whole world full of bad childhoods. Look at the last 50 years. Things went south all over. Some of us have gotten to an age where our pee floats without warning. It's not pretty, the anti-gravity and the having to pee, it never was. You'd think they'd find a way to deal, but I spend a lot of time with a plastic sack tied to a stick these days, just like everyone else our age. It's like I'm Nabokov after butterflies, but not. Damn it, said Bert when he called. That little pony canceled on me again. Got a spot for you at Dim Sun, you're interested. I'm thinking of de-starring them. They're scared. They'll feed us upright. I'm there, I said. I'm there in five minutes. I had to make a quick portal. It took a bribe to my ex, the welder, short notice, but she had the right materials. She hacks out a chunk of universe out and I walked through it and into the restaurant. The music's changed since the last time I was here before it got popular. Now we have some si some sort of botanical singing, like electronic music used to be prior to everything getting more exotic. This is the secret language of plants, and it turns out plants like to break it down. Is that a fern? I ask Bert Gold, who is arriving just ahead of me, stepping out of the air, his black t-shirt rumpled, his ponytail done up in a coil for the occasion. Sometimes Bert wears his hair in the local style. No, that's just some kind of marigold, he says. Listen, it's got no base. I miss synth. Fucking organics everywhere you go these days. Want to know a secret? What secret? I don't know, Bert says. I'm fresh out, but I bet someone here's got their thumb in a plum. In the old days, back on Earth, Bert was a sin eater, except the reverse, a sin spitter. He'd take someone's sins and then he'd walk them to another part of the world where he'd spit them out in a hole in the dirt, cover them over, and grow magic plants. There was a period of time when the ground post-radiation was really fertile. It grew whole vines of sins, twisting ropes of bright green infidelity, yellow-leafed embezzlement, perennially flowering neighbor's wife. People paid money to display the things Bert planted. He was a horticulturist to the stars, decking their gardens out in the sins of everyone else. Up here, his job is a demotion from what he did on Earth, but sin chewing gave him tooth trouble, and he was happy to stop that line of work. Now that he's a critic, though, he's basically doing the same thing under a different title. From what I hear, this tastes better. I'm hungry, I say to Bert. He looks at me and grins. You're always hungry, he says. That's true. 
I've been hungry since I was born. The cart rolls past. I crane my neck to see what's on display, but it's all still under wraps. The windows are steamed up and people look desperate for a taste. The crowd here is pretty skinny and young and they're from all over the place. I take a moment to appreciate them. A couple have tentacles and a couple more are wearing classic big eyes, pointy chins. Apparently that's coming back. I never went in for that style. The real stuff is more interesting. Life out here was never going to be the kind of pretty that people from earth could appreciate. The, re the restaurants are all about dress up and cover whatever you really look like and dressing like the seventies, oh, I'm sorry, unless you're us. We look like two old guys from the blue and green born in the fifties and dressing like the seventies still have hold of us. For a while we rode motorcycles. Now we just walk and it's hard enough. We feel heroic, me and Bert, though Bert has been known to use wheels on occasion. He's not as young as he used to be. Who is? We're seated at the best table and I watch the wait staff flitter frantically in the corners. Bert Gold calls ahead, but only by five minutes. He comes into your restaurant without any real warning. That's his deal. If you're not prepared to, he waves his hand in the air. And it's got wheels made of magnets because without them, it'd be the saddest place. All the dim sun would just be flying around, splatting onto customers. We're going to have the dim sun unlimited, Bert Gold says. How's that today? Amazing is always a pleasure, a privilege. It's uneasy. I glance at the cart. The cover they've got on it is glowing. Whatever the specials are, they're volatile. Bring it, I say. I want to eat dim sum and I want to eat it desperately. It's been months since I've tasted it. This place does it right. The waiter whips out a damp towel and some fire retardant and gets ready to present. But the front door opens with a whoosh and we all look over, startled. Nobody uses the door here. It's just for show. It opens onto nothing. Shit, says Bert Gold. And there's a whimper in his voice. How'd she know? Somebody in the kitchen must be on her payroll. Everyone's on her payroll, Bert, I say. Bert's ex-wife, Harriet, is burning her way in the door with her white hair twisted into coils identical to his. Harriet Gold, unlike Bert, can go anywhere she wants to without an invitation. Bert has to be a critic feared by chefs. Harriet has an all-access pass. She always did. When he married her, everyone knew he'd gotten lucky. It didn't take long for her to figure out that Bert had an eye a mile wide and that no matter who he had, all he could do was hunt for a younger model. Harriet kicked him in the balls and divorced him. And ever since, he's been in mourning. She got Earth. Bert got booted up here to the colonies. That doesn't mean Harriet doesn't travel all the time. She has friends on every planet this, these days. And wherever she is, Bert's uncomfortable. He's risen up three inches from his chair even now with the memory of that kick. I feel like doing a sympathy wince, but I know if I show weakness, Harriet will be at me too. She and I used to be close back when they were a couple. Bert got me in the divorce and Harriet got the rest of everything and everyone. Poor Bert, I'd say, except Bert is a freestanding catastrophe. I don't feel bad for Bert. He brought it on himself. Bert, Harriet says crisply as she arrives at our table. Fancy meeting you here. She flicks him in the ear with her screwdriver of a fingernail. Harriet's wearing a swath of somebody's sky wrapped around her like a toga and she glitters in a migraine inducing way. Rodney, she says, I don't know why you still hang out with this miscreant. Miscreant is classic Harriet. We used to play Scrabble together back in the old days. I'm hungry, I say and shrug. I don't make eye contact. I'm ashamed of myself. I only went with Bert because of his connections. But over the years, it's become clear to me that Bert Gold is a piece of work. I'm living in a rental pod up here because once Bert left and Harriet took over, it wasn't like I was welcome on earth. We all used to be neighbors. After the divorce, Bert grew a hedge of deathbed regrets between me and him and the rest of the neighborhood, and we played racquetball for three months straight until at last the transport brought us up here. Harriet was on the other side of that hedge. We could hear her. She had a few things to say. She also had a string of lovers who could have made God blush. Then she rose in the world. She was always going to. It was a matter of time. She sits down at the table, twisting Sky around one shoulder so that her arms are both bare and ready for dining. I'll have the dim sun ultimate, she says to the waiter who is shaking in his boots at the presence of power. The ultimate, asks Bert, suddenly losing his confidence in our order. We'll get the ultimate too then, if that's what she's having. Harriet smiles sweetly. I take a nervous sip of my drink. The cart is up on one wheel, making its way over to us. The restaurant is freakishly quiet. It's not every day you see the chief food critic of outer space and the president of the universe sitting down to a meal together. Are you good with the poisonous ones, Bert? Harriet asks. Asks Bert. When we were together, I remember you had some allergies. 
She's not raw. Bird is allergic to raw. She's not. She swallows raw right alongside cooked easily without even thinking about it. I'm not going to eat the poisonous ones, Harriet, says Bert. Rodney is going to eat them for me. I give him a sharp look. One of his lovely lady dinner companions died of dark matter, not even that long ago. The chef made an error preparing it, and that was it for her. Bert mourned for about five minutes and then claimed it was a risk of fine dining. He gave the place a second star for being real. Well, he's your only friend, says Harriet, but I guess he's disposable. Sorry, Rodney, your choice. You could have come with me. Would have been better than spending eternity hanging out with this cretin, don't you think? The cart is beside us again. I have to wonder if they've spiced it up in the kitchen. This won't be regular dim sun fare, not with Harriet here. The president doesn't frequent regular places. I notice several diners rigid at their tables and salute. At ease, says Harriet. I make note of their faces, military. And if that's what they are, I don't want to be on their wrong side. I used to be military myself. The cart beside us is glowing gently and the most thrilling smells are coming from it. The ultimate, says the chef out of the kitchen now to pay his respects. We're honored to be your dining choice this evening, President Gold. You ruined my anonymity, says Bert pitifully. I'm here as a critic. Now they all know who I am. No one even knows you're here, Bert. Not now that I'm in the room, says Harriet. And that's about right. You're forgotten too, Rodney. You can slip out if you like. I want to. Dinner with the two of them is always excruciating, but I can't help myself. The smell of the food is killing me and whatever they've added to the menu, I want it. I'm hungry, I say. My stomach growls. It's like the old days, the pizza and beer and pot haze. Up here, Bert once let me accompany him to a meal consumed in our sleep, where we sat at a table covered in a blanket of napkins and dreamed our dinner, some kind of godlike nectar full of apricots. But that was nothing compared to stoner food back on earth. The smells in this restaurant, they're like fried things, cheese and melted tomato sauce. I'm salivating. I am ready. Under that cloth is heaven. I think for a moment about all the things I miss, the rinds and puffs, the dripping puddles of oil. I think of how the colonies have nothing like the foods of my youth. The food on earth really tasted like something. In the colonies, you're lucky to get a taste of anything real. Everything up here is organic and heirloom. And if you ask me, that shit tastes like shit. They raided the seed vault and brought up varieties of tomato cultivated in the 1800s. Lemony fleshed cucumbers, plump oats, cloned a troop of red and white cows with smiling faces and high cream productivity. And now all the food is farm to table. Give me the fried things. I hate it. Give me the processed and the packaged. Give me the junk. Bert brings out his little rating notebook. Harriet stretches her arms wide to encompass the table and then she cracks her neck. I sit back, belly out, ready to eat by weight in one bites. Usually I get the signature dish first, the dim sun itself, but tonight's special. The chef pulls the cloth off the cart and we're on. Interesting. No time? Okay, good. Rings of Saturn, the chef says. Deep fried, flash drenched in Mars water ice and then fried again. His assistant is standing by with a fire extinguisher, but this is nothing. The rings are small, a bit blurry and clearly crisp. They glow a little, which might be worrying for some, but Bert Gold and I are invulnerable. We're connoisseurs of spice. These rings are fried in some kind of astral napalm. I take one and crunch into it with my front teeth, feeling it beginning to burn the roof of my mouth. It makes me hard. I'm telling you, I miss onion rings. Back in the day, me and Bert were at a bar one night and I put seven onion rings around my business. Didn't end the way I thought it might. I was looking at the ladies, they were laughing at me. People, it turned out, didn't feel the same way I did about rings. There's a photo somewhere. Nice, Bert mutters, scribbling notes. Though I could have done without the second fry. The napalm tastes like Cindy's sweat back in San Francisco, that sweet, sweet Cindy, our delicate dance of kink and desire. That last he says in his patented Bert Gold indiscreet voice. The diners around us are dislodged from their attempts to pretend they aren't already staring at our table. Harriet has managed to down an entire basket of rings and is now eating something tiny and wriggling, little motes of light that she grabs with tongs from out of the air. Are you sure about that, Bert? I think it tastes like Thomas, Harriet says, at a similar volume. And when I say sweat, I mean the way Thomas would come in after a run, drenched, and I'd lick it from his biceps. Remember that, Bert? Remember Thomas? 
Remember him? He was lovely. Remember how Thomas used to pick me up and carry me up the stairs? Remember how we used to shut the door so hard you'd hear it slam from all the way behind your stupid hedge of mosquito harboring deathbed regrets? Even I remember Thomas. Bert looks up at Harriet, unblinking, up for the challenge. Cindy was the one who grew fur after the radiation hit. I used to rub her pelt backward to generate electricity for the whole block. Oh man, I knew some really beautiful women before you and after you too, he says, and then sighs, shaking his head sadly at Harriet as he munches a bite of Saturn. Harriet isn't beautiful. What Bert Gold has never realized is that she doesn't give a damn. Harriet is what you'd call striking, as in a match, to light a cigarette. Bert Gold was a fool to lose her. Beautiful has nothing to do with anything in the long run. Somebody like Harriet keeps a man busy. Harriet even kept me busy as her neighbor. I was regularly trying to parse her philosophies. She talked circles around me, sending me running to the encyclopedia on the regular. Back when we were all in our 40s, Harriet blazed so bright she hurt the eyes. She's not any calmer now. Harriet's 70 years old and her perfume smells like smoke hitting a thunderstorm. I can see the telltale gleam of a firearm stuffed down her cleavage. And there's a whip curled around her shoulder around the silky bit of sky she must have had to hire a team of thieves to tug out of its comfortable spot. Don't trifle with me, Bert Gold, Harriet says. You exaggerate. I met Cindy. You call it a pelt, I call it peach fuzz. Harriet's hair recoils itself into tight knots. She puts an entire dumpling into her mouth and chews it very slowly. The insides of her cheeks flash a lot of different colors, red and purple, electric green, and something about it, the transparency, the expression of rapture on her face is shockingly sexy. I think for a moment about the unpredictability of lust, about how once back on earth, I fucked a snack cake. I made a thousand layered heap of them and cut holes in the creamy centers. It was as good as it sounds. I'm still eating. Their battle means they aren't paying attention to the cart, and so I'm grabbing my fill. I take a peek into each basket, then have a mouthful of moats, each one bouncing around on my teeth and fizzing as they explode. I owe moonlight, the chef whispers proudly. I give them a little bath of liquid nitrogen. I open my mouth for more, but I can see the rest of the dumplings plump and rosy, and Harriet is reaching out for another. I'm worried she'll eat them all before I get to try them, but she passes me one. Red dwarf, she says to me. Reminds me of some other things. She looks meaningfully at Bert's crotch. Bert doesn't flinch. He stuffs a red dwarf into his mouth like he's a goat gnawing a tire. He's not even taking notes, just making rambling fake writing scribbles on his notepad. The dumpling is soup filled and explodes in my mouth. When I dab at my lips, a blood colored liquid stains the napkin. It's reminiscent of the cream soda that got outlawed for filtering through pee and messing up the pH of the oceans. Over the years, the FDA took away everything delicious on earth. This is excellent, I tell Harriet. Isn't it though, Rodney, she says. Her voice is sweet and polite. You'd think Bert Gold was a thousand light years away. This is one of my favorite places, has been for ages, but it upsets my digestion to see Bert Gold here. Bert sits up very straight, his belly pushing out of his shirt. You know this is my restaurant, he says. I discovered it way back when. I've been coming here for a decade. This is mine, Harriet. I know what he's thinking. Harriet's about to claim custody of yet another place. What is there to say when your ex-wife becomes the president of the universe? She's got 99% of the vote. Bert Gold got nothing but belly. He made the bad call of pissing her off. This divorce could have been friendly, but Bert Gold posted photos all over the place of himself with a bevy of beauties. Bert Gold sent lewd messages to Harriet's friends and enemies. Bert Gold roved like a NASA vehicle. Also, and worst of all, Bert Gold underestimated Harriet Gold's intellect. He'd never paid any attention to the designs she'd been drafting in her spare time. The whole portal system is Harriet's invention. She made climbing through the space-time continuum as easy as climbing through a bathroom window. Now space travel is like buying a bus ticket. You're being an idiot, Bert, I say, and then I reach into a little basket and grab a handful of something black covered in a soft mosaic of sweet crumbs. It's light in my fingers and I nearly let, lose it to floating. You might not want to eat that one, Rodney, says Harriet. Why not, says Bert. I had it when I was here last, says Harriet. It's not really for human consumption. I mean, not for normal humans anyway. It's pretty gourmet. Not everyone can handle it. She moves the basket a little out of Bert's reach and Bert's hand jolts out like a cotton mouth from a creek bottom. 
He grabs the basket from Harriet and tugs. Bert's nothing if not predictable. What is it, Bert Gold asks the chef, pouring the little black objects onto his plate like he's a starving man. I notice Harriet giving the chef a look and the chef shrugs and says, odds and ends, noble gases, couple of rogue elements in a crispity crust of interstellar dust. Bert pops one into his mouth. He smacks his lips. Tastes like donut, he says. And so I take one too, disregarding the look I saw the chef and the president of the universe exchange. I roll it around on my tongue, feeling the stardust rub off. I've eaten stardust before. It's cinnamony and a little rough, a little hint of filth in it, like eating cheese puffs squashed up out of a dirty hand. It's pretty good. Maybe not double star level, but pretty good. All is well until I bite down and find nothing in the center. Donut hole, I say to Bert, not the same as a donut. I feel obscurely emotional, disappointed at the loss of the chewy center. I look at the chef. This is just the whole, right? Is that what we're eating? Harriet looks at Bert and grins. Bert gets a very unhappy look on his face. That's when I feel it. The nothing makes its way down my throat and into my belly. The nothing swells to fill my stomach. It's a black bleakness, a twisting unfurling into itself like something being wrung and simultaneously growing. Black hole, says Harriet and shrugs. What can I tell you, Bert? How specialty, I think I warned you. Bert's belly is bigger than it was. He looks pregnant. I look down at mine, same. The chef twitches his bandana nervously. Surely being president of the universe doesn't mean you can murder your ex-husband and his best and only friend in the middle of a crowded restaurant. Surely it can't mean that. Harriet smiles at me. Antidote, Bert sputters. Who says there's an antidote? Maybe this is your last supper. Harriet, I say. Harriet, that's not fair. My words sound weirdly slurred to me, and I reach up my hand to touch my mouth. My lips are curling backward. What did I ever do to you, I say to Harriet. My belly is huge now, bigger than the table. It's full of nothing and everything at once. I can tell it's only a matter of time before I flip into an inside-out exploded man sock. I've always been hungry, but now the hunger is a bulging starvation. Bert and I have always thought well as a team, but I am pissed with him. I think of those months of racquetball. He owes me. He shouldn't put me in situations like this. I look around at all the young lovelies, all the tentacled, pointy-chinned, pretty things who are stargazing their idol Harriet and the vengeance she's wrought. Bert, across from me, is in similarly dire straits. He's holding his burgeoning belly with both hands, but I see him look toward the cart and the glow on it. There are a couple of dishes still left, one in a covered metal basket. I look at Bert. I nod. A bit of black hole leaks out the corner of Bert's mouth and he moans. I watch it take over a piece of his cheek, look through it and see a whole lot of nowhere I want to live. I tilt like a gumbok. Some of the old Scrabble words still stay with me, roly pulling my way at the cart. My extruded belly button serves as a pivot point. What are you doing? Asks Harriet. Rodney, don't think you're getting him out of this. This is Bert's own fault. I grab the basket with the dim sun in it and tilt it back to center. I grab it like I'm a warrior because I'm sitting opposite a real warrior and I know she'll have me if I don't eat fast. The dim sun is a big disc covered in golden red melt with spots of darkness from the oven. It's what I've been smelling this whole time, the cheesy tomato goodness, the crackle and the heat. You can only get that level of boiling ignition by using a cosmic microwave. I salute the chef with a quick, quick fist pump and then I break the dim sun in half and shove it at Bert. I can feel my finger bones freezing where the dark spots are. The bright spots are scalding my skin off. Take that, Harriet, I shout, and then I fold my part of the dim sun in half and shove it into my maw, chomping down on it with the dentures I had specially made. They can withstand anything I'd want to eat. It's whole, hot, and cold, and delicious. It's junk in the most divine sense. Celestial debris, a miniature of the fail of Earth's sun, and all over the universe, these are a coveted item. They fill you up no matter what. They're known for it. Bert's gobbling his down, and so am I, though I'm tempted to savor it more slowly. I can feel it quieting the black hole, stopping its progress. My belly shrinks. The dark is retreating. The melting goodness covers over the nothing in my shirt, now tattered, relaxes. Harriet sighs and stands up. She has her own whole dim sun already nibbled around the edges. She eats it in three bites, showing incredible tolerance for the burn. 
You're always entertaining, Harriet, Bert Gold says, wiping his mouth. I'd wish you better luck next time, but you'd miss me if you caused me to be absorbed into the dark. You should try and get over me. The chef passes Harriet a small dessert cone. She licks at it like a pleased cat. Bert looks at it enviously. I know his mouth, like mine, is blistered. Comet ice, she says, and shrugs. She offers the cone to me and gives me a single lick, which instantly ruins me. It's not normal comet ice. It's the kind of thing that delivers seas to a dry planet. Faintly strawberry, faintly coconut, a little rum, a little gasoline. It's a cocktail of perfection and it soothes my burns. Harriet's not bad. She never was. In fact, I always liked Harriet. Why I'm the guy Bert got in the divorce, I do not know. He chose me, but I should never have chosen him back. That was completely your fault, Rodney, Bert says petulantly. You're supposed to be the taster. I won't take you places if you don't do your job. I shouldn't have even had any of that black hole in my mouth. I'm unstarring this place and reporting it to health and safety, says Bert. I am. I look at Bert, waiting for him to apologize. He does not. Have one of these, I say, and I pass Bert the last basket on the cart. After all these years, I'm finally sick of Bert. He's criminally ungrateful. I just saved him from a black hole, and will he ever say thank you? No. He's never been nice, not really. I'm only here because a lady canceled on him and she was right to do it. Bert will never learn. What are they? They're delicious, I say, but dangerous. It's sort of like that French cheese you had back in San Francisco, the one that walked. I didn't eat that cheese. I was never a gourmand like Bert. You couldn't have paid me enough. I preferred a nice processed cheese spread slathered on hot dog. Bert grumbles a little, but he opens the basket. Little exotic crullers inside it with a creamy filling. He perks up. Long as they aren't raw, says Bert, I have allergies. Not raw, says the chef. These aren't even special. There's something the back kitchen whipped up. Grandma food, you ask me. Retro, says Bert, clearly taking notes even as he bites in. Home cooked, chefs, chefs washed up, but the kitchen staff innovates with traditional flavors. Harriet and I watch as he puts the pastry in his mouth, chews and swallows. His head stretches, his ankles extend. His belly contracts and then rolls out to a long rubber band of middle. See you, Bert, I say. Damn it, Bert says, damn it all, wormhole. Wormhole, Harriet confirms. Harriet and I watch as Bert Gold starts time traveling from both ends. His belly stays, the rest of him flickers through time and space. His head is briefly in the 1820s while his backside visits the dark side of the moon circa 2000 years from now. His feet step momentarily into Mesopotamia while his head dunks in a mucky sixth century bog. Harriet gives me another lick of her ice. She hoists up her swath of sky, scatters the crumbs in it and rewraps it around her midriff. Nice to see you, Rodney, she says. She heads for the door. Can I call you, I ask? You can take over as critic, Harriet says. Looks like that position's open. I like to eat. I like hungry company. I'll see you around. She walks out into the nowhere, the sky shining in her wake. She's striking Harriet even more than usual. I look down at Bert. He's divided between Mars and Pluto. I can see it, each place a flicker. His belly remains the same, stuck here in the middle. I look at the chef. He shrugs. Kitchen works for the president, he says. What will you do with him, I ask. The president has provided for his care. The chef wraps Bert Gold in a tablecloth and slings him over his shoulder. Bert's head is in the Wild West. His legs are clamped around a shuttle from the early years of the colonies. I wonder if he's eating well on his journey. When I get ready to leave the restaurant, I discover that the president of the universe has paid the check. What can I say? The woman keeps a guy busy. She keeps everything busy. She teaches me things. I learn words from Harriet, which is more than I ever learned from Bert Gold. All he ever did was hit me with racquetballs and kick me out of fancy restaurants midway through the amuse-bouche. Things are different now. I'm free of Bert Gold. I'm already hungry again and the universe is wide. I pick up Bert's rating note notebook. I walk out the door into the great darkness. There are things to eat out there. It's the end of that story. And I think I have like two seconds left remaining maybe. How long? Let's see. 29 seconds. During which I will say, please donate to restaurant workers because that's what that story is about. It's about amazing restaurants that keep you satisfied and joyful and comfortable. And also in this time, people who provide comfort, they're doing hard work. So 
I've been thinking about all of them as I've been reading the story and as and even as I wrote the story. I always love restaurants. Have a great rest.